Brandon, what's up, man? Good to see you again. Glad to have you back and uh, joining us on the Order of Man podcast. Yeah, my, my pleasure. I, I, I should have looked. I don't know how long it's been, but uh, it hasn't been that long in the amount of stuff. We'll just say stuff right now that's happened <laughs> since I last talked to you is just, it's absolutely insane. I think it's a testament to the earlier conversation that we had. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. The world, the world is going crazy. <laughs> it is. It is. What, what do you attribute that to? Um, I, I think it's a lot of things. It's a lot of different things, man. I think, I think the COVID thing and the mo people's emotions are very high. People are, you know, the economy is uncertain. You know, people have lost faith in God. Pastors are pimped out. I mean, you, you all of these things is a combination of um, this this division that we face and this this unlawfulness in, in the minds of people. So I think it's a it's a it's a few different things. It's hard to put my finger on one thing, but uh, there's a lot of contributing factors here. You know, one of the things that makes me most frustrated is I, I, I genuinely believe that you're trying to put good information of the world. I'm trying to put good information of the world. And it seems like even as you try to put a good message out in the world and you try to share how you might be able to help, people still are so pessimistic about it and almost indifferent and nihilistic to potential solutions to solve some of our problems. And that's becoming very discouraging for me. I don't know how you feel about that. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I hate to say this. I don't want to say I'm pessimistic myself, but most people are, they're just following the trend. You know, I've learned that a lot of people don't do any research for themselves. Uh, they're not optimistic because they don't, they haven't looked into nothing. They don't, they don't understand. They just listen to a pundit. So if a guy that they like the most is telling you that everything is going to crap and, and, and nothing is going to get better, there's no solutions to the problem, they believe it. They're not going to look anything up. They're not going to do research on their own. They're not going to consult with their family. They're going to believe whoever they want to believe. Um, and I think that that's probably majority of the people. Thank God that a lot of people follow me. So the majority of people will hear a positive message from me. And, and a lot of the and probably a lot of those people just run with it, you know. So, um, you know, in no way, form or fashion am I dissing anybody that, that support me or support you or whatever. But I would encourage people to to be individuals, too. You know, don't forget about your own individual excellence. And the fact that if you if you see a problem out there, if you if you are looking for solutions, you have the availability and access, especially if you live in America, to research and come to your own conclusion. Even if you follow people you trust, listen to them, hear them as a side of the argument, and then draw your own conclusions based on the things that you have actually looked into and researched. Yeah, you know, another thing I think is important is just getting to know people offline. Um, I was having an online conversation about, um, oh, this, uh, this woman uh, had posted a sign on her door, like, I'm a single mother trying to, trying to take care of this business and you know, please have mercy. Don't be looting and writing and whatnot around my store. And I posted this and, you know, I had some people agree. The overwhelming majority of people agree that we as men should step up and protect and things like that. But I had a couple of people who disagreed, but there was one conversation in particular with somebody who I don't think we saw things totally eye to eye, but the difference is, is that we actually know each other. We've broken bread together. We spent time together. We've talked face to face together and even in disagreement, we can be respectful and we can try to come to some mutual conclusions because we know each other. But so many people, man, they don't even know their neighbors, let alone these random strangers they're talking to on the internet. Yeah, man, I think that's a, I think that's a big problem. You know, I, I, I have to say, I've never met a person that truly disagreed with me in person. You know, I, I've, I've never had it happen. Like people that meet me in person and actually talk to me and have a discussion with me, whether they disagree or not, um, they tend to lean more towards saying, you know what, I understand where you're coming from. You know, I actually agree on most things with you. You know, you're not what I thought you were. You know, I, that's why people need to understand the, the, what the Internet is for. You know, the innocent, Internet is a snapshot of whatever situation that you're looking into, you know, whether you're uh, looking into politics, whether you're looking into personalities, it's a snapshot. It's not the complete person. You know, I'm, I'm different in person than I am online because I'm making a video reacting to something. And this is my emotional experience plus facts um, that I've gathered on a particular topic for eight minutes, you know, in reality, when I'm at events or when I'm speaking for longer periods of time and I, you get to ask me Q&A, it's not this, you know, hyped up um, um, take, hot take on something. It's more of a nuanced thing and people get a chance to see my, my complete character in, in some cases. And I, I tell you what, people often say, 
oh man, I, I thought you were different or whatever the case may be. Um, and, and I think it's a value in actually getting to know people and, and having a, a common ground understanding of that person, a little bit of respect for that person to a certain degree. And then you can have proper communication. You know, a lot of people, they have no idea who they're talking to and they build this image in their mind of who they're talking to. You're either a bad guy or you're the greatest person they ever met, even though they don't know you. Um, and then they build their arguments and emotional response around that fact. And I think it get people in trouble sometimes by doing that. Yeah, I think that's true. You know, one of the things people will say a lot is, well, you know, Ryan, you made this post or whatever, and it's not that simple. Yeah, I know, because I have 140 characters to make a point. <laughs> so, of yeah. course, there's nuance. Of course, there's, I, I had a buddy of mine reach out the other day, and we had a, a, a little bit of a disagreement on social media. Um, and I think we both misinterpreted where each other were coming from. And then we hopped on the phone, and it was completely different. Yeah. You know, but, um, yeah. but we take social media as this like end all be all. This is the only place this perfectly encapsulates what the entirety of what a person thinks. And it just isn't the case, man, at all. You know that. No, that's why I hate text messages. I hate tech. I hate text messages. Anybody that work with me, work for me, I hate it. Um, even when I do um, send messages to my team, I'll, I often do them in the voice chat, you know, a voice recording, mm -hmm. because I'm like, I can't explain to you exactly what I'm talking about. There's nuances to, and, and maybe that's the way my brain works. Like these, these simplistic ex explanations to me are, 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 are I, I, I can't, that's not enough for me. It's not enough for you to ask me, Hey, Brandon, um, uh, I got a couple of things I need to talk to you about the store. Like I got an e-commerce store, a couple of things I need to talk sure. about the store. I just had a question about this one item. It's like, no, I have to explain to you the nuances of what I'm about to respond. It's not just the one item. You got to go here. You got to go here. You got to go here. And this is the spirit behind what I'm saying to you. And so I need you to give you a full explanation. So when you go out and do something, I know that you have a full understanding of what my expectation is versus me texting you something back. And then you go do something. And I go back. Why did you do that? Oh, but, oh, cause you didn't understand that there's five steps around what I just told you. Right. And the same thing happens on social media and everything else. You know, you can write people are, I, I, I'm going to say this, man, people are nutty online. They're just completely nutty. Like, so are we I, though, I, to be, to be truthful right, about it. You know, right, we get that right. same way. <laughs> yeah. But I, I think some people, especially people that I see in my comment section, I don't know if they follow him, follow me or not, but I mean, people would literally you can give a statement and this is, this has happened to me plenty of times. I can make a statement about women and I can say not all women are applicable in this situation. However, this is my opinion based on few women that have these uh, characteristics and people would literally get in the comment section and go, you are, that, that's not every woman. I said, mm -hmm. The first I know, sentence, I've made that I say not already. all women and they, they can't, they, they can't accept it. Let me, let me give you an example. I was talking about the Zach Stacy situation that football player that beat up his girlfriend. Right. Right. And, and I, I don't know how many times I've said this, maybe a thousand. Every time I talk about the situation, I say he deserves to go to jail. There is no articulable explanation of why you're in that woman's house and you putting your hands on her. He deserves to go to jail. But then I said, what people have to understand is that in any situations, there's always two sides to the argument. There is a possibility. I said, I, I don't know if it is or not, but there is a possibility. Um, I don't know if it's true or not is what I'm saying, but there's a possibility that this is a toxic relationship. And there are some women that can push men to the end of the road. And then they want to act out. Most men do not. And this guy acted out because people want to make it seem like, Oh, she's just a, I don't know if she's a victim or not, but I'm saying like the, you have to look at it as she could be a complete victim. Um, she, I mean, she's a victim of a crime, but I'm saying she's completely had nothing to do with this. The guy just came in her house and beat her up because it was a Thursday, you know? So, or the, they're in a toxic relationship. She could have possibly said a lot of hurtful, violent things to him. And he, and he actually showed up and, and, and did something about it. Those possibilities could exist. People die in the comment section. You you're blaming her. I'm saying we don't know why they got into a fight. I don't know what made that man want to put his hands on that woman like that. And most of the time, as a former police officer, and the things that I've dealt with is normally a backstory. There's normally some stuff that have transpired between two people to make one or the other person become extremely violent in an instance. So, but in the comment section, you said he, he should be in jail. It's like, come on, people. 
how many times do I have to explain this for you not to, you know, for you to understand the, the, the totality of what I'm trying to explain. But that's just one aspect that just bothers me with people online. Yeah. I mean, it's frustrating because, you know, in this case, and I haven't been following it too closely. I saw the video and saw some commentary on it, but you know, two things can exist simultaneously. You know, maybe she's verbally abusive. You know, maybe she's done some things. Maybe she threatened. Now that does, does that give him permission to literally right. beat the living hell out of her? No, of course not. Right. Right. You know, and so both can exist simultaneously, but we live in this world, especially online of black and whites. It's either I'm a hundred percent red or I'm a hundred percent blue. I'm a hundred percent left, a hundred percent right, hundred percent this guy, hundred percent her. It's like, hold on, let's try to figure out the nuance of this so we can make better, more informed decisions that will yep. lead everybody else to a better place. That's the point. Yep. That's, that's my whole goal. I'm not God. The things that I say are rooted in the experiences that I have and the research that I have done. And I tell people all the time, don't believe me. Go research yourself. You're getting a perspective. You're getting a perspective. I'm giving you facts. I'm giving you um, journals that I've re uh, read. I'm giving you uh, stats that I've read from reputable sources. You go and verify those things if you want to make a, a totality, uh, you know, you want to make a conclusion in something. You know, never listen to anybody and just take it at face value verify what people say and then you will gain trust in that person everybody that watch me know that well, the sources that i'm giving are verifiable but you need to verify that and when you do you can say okay this guy is very very trustworthy so if i'm on a whim and i hear him say something i can at least uh have a have faith that this guy has done real research and then i can go look up look it up later but you know I, people are so sheepish sometimes that that's why the mainstream media is that's why they can convince people of so much, so many different things. People say, Oh, it's they're on TV. So they must be telling the truth. Oh, this person was a victim of a crime. So they must be completely innocent of doing it. And they've done nothing to um, their involvement in this situation. And I wish that people would think a little bit more out of the box and say, and this is something I learned as a cop, man, because I got challenged on it a few times is that there's always two sides to everything that happened in life, always, always, you know, uh, uh, on the Stacy thing, I would love to see their cell phone conversations. You know, I would love to see that conversation that happened before they got into this or the week before. I want to see all their conversations. What kind of, what kind of conversation are they having? What kind of character does she have? We already see that he, he's, he's physically violent, but what, what kind of character does this young lady have? Um, so then you can put a better picture together and say, OK, he still deserved to go to jail, but I can see that somebody should have been communicating with that young man and, and encouraging him. Don't do it. I know you mad. I know she didn't push the buttons, but don't do it because this is exactly what she probably wants you to do. And, and, and let me just say this. Some people don't have life experience either. That's why they can't see things and they can't go deeper in these situations. And I keep going back to the Stacy thing because I've been in a relationship with somebody who was incredibly toxic. I mean, incredibly toxic, saying hurtful things in, in, an, in, a, in an attempt to make me blow up on them. That's what they want. So mm -hmm. I can be the bad guy if I blow up and slap them or put my hands on them or something. But as a mature adult male, you know, I realized that just because I feel a certain way don't mean I have to act on it. Just because you make me upset or make me wanna be violent with you, male or female, it doesn't mean that I have to be violent with you. I'm, I'm smart enough to know that this is a temporary emotion and I'm smart enough to know that you're, you want me to react. And so what do I do? I say, you know what, let me pray about it. Let me just separate myself from the situation because I grew up in a very violent environment. So violence isn't, a, you know, isn't that odd for me. And I grew up where that's how I handled my problems is I would become violent. You know, if somebody disrespected me, I would become violent when I was younger. And as an adult, I understand that that's still in me, but you have to be able to uh, compartmentalize it and use that energy in a different direction. Because now as an adult, you go to prison for violence. You know, you don't, you don't get a second chance. You lose reputation over violence. You, you lose respect over violence. Um, I had a situation where I had a, a business partner I had to buy out of my company. Um, you know, 
I wanted to become very violent with this individual. And we were face to face. And this is I'm, I'm an adult. I'm saved and everything. And I, I, I thought about it and I said, you know what, Brandon, you grown. Like, there's no violence necessary. Buy this guy out of the company and separate yourself from him. There's no need for that. you got a family. you got everything else. You go ride your bike, go lift some weights, go make some videos. There's no need to be violent in these situations. And that's something that I learned as a mature man. Well, I, you know, one of the things that I think is a big problem with this country is that we have a rising generation of fatherless homes. So these young men, and look, I don't, I don't buy into the whole toxic masculinity notion because I think that's a, that's a game that's played. It's, it's, a, it's a word game that's played to be able to paint all masculinity as, as inherently toxic. So I don't get into that. But also men, and I realize young, young men, boys, need to learn how to harness their masculinity because yeah, we do have a propensity for violence. Like I don't think anybody who knows anything about males would disagree with that, right? We generally tend to be more violent. We generally tend to be more aggressive. We generally tend to be more dominant. And so if these young men don't have other men, mature men, like you're talking about in their corner, teaching them how to utilize that aggression, potential violence, dominance, for the betterment of themselves and the people they care about. Yeah. It's very easy to see how it would spill out in destructive ways. Yeah. I, th- I, w- I think every man in, on, on earth should be violent. However, you should be able to harness that violence because there's necessary violence at points in your life. When you go to war, if you fight for your country, you got to be violent. You may have to kill people in the pursuit of freedom for your country. Um, when I was a police officer, I talked to elderly people. I talked to little kids. But then there's times where I got to be violent. You can't be a punk. You can't back down and be afraid and timid of confrontation. But you need to be able to harness it and apply it when it's absolutely necessary. If somebody came in my house and I have to defend my family, I'm going to be violent. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? I'm not going to sure. be calling the police and be. ducking and, and hiding. And me and my wife get in a corner. It's going to be SWAT team. SWAT call out all over again in my mind, and I'm going to be extremely violent. But like I said, every man should harness that violence and aggression and be able to apply it when necessary and de-escalate when necessary. I don't believe that people should um, take away that tendency from themselves. And that's the problem with this femininity, this false femininity, and this fake concept of, of toxic masculinity. God has given us these emotional and testosterone responses for a reason because there may be a time where you have to fight a flight type situation and you need to be able to do that effectively that's how men have stayed alive you know so long that's how civilizations have stayed alive because there were strong men who understand how to harness that even at the point of death or even at the point of no return going on foreign land and fighting for your life so that other people can be free if everybody was living in the sense where you have to remove all violence from your personality, from your character, um, where would we be? There would be no beaches of Normandy. There, there would be no civil war. There would be uh, no Afghanistan. There would be no people in the military today that are willing to fight and lose their lives. You know, my friend, uh, uh, one of my friends, and I don't want to say his name, but he got shot 26 times uh, in, in the special forces. He was a Navy mm. SEAL. 26 times he got shot 26 times and you know of course a lot of them hit his vest but I mean that that guy still today has a has issues I think you know psychological issues because he had to kill a few people during that scenario right how could you not Uh, sure right right I mean but at the end he said he watched one of his great friends die you know so you know you have to have that as a man but like you said you need other men who are mature to help you harness that and apply that energy in the right, you know, in the right areas. You know, one of the, one of the things that just happened over the past couple of days as of this recording is this uh, horrible tragedy in uh, Waukesha, I think is how it's pronounced, but you know, I, I think most of us have heard the story, but there's one thing that I think is, is being overlooked. You know, there was, if I understand correctly, an off duty police officer who fired back at that, at that vehicle as was plowing through uh, the elderly and, and the children of, of, of that, uh, of that community. And I thought, you know, like everybody else is, is hiding and cowering. And certainly that's, that's an appropriate response of a vehicle is barreling towards you, of course. But this individual, this police officer stood up, drew his pistol, fired back, 
also to some degree was pretty, must've been pretty aware of where he was firing. Cause there was a lot of people there didn't hit anybody else. And, and you know, that's, that's, that to me is a, is a, a prime example of somebody who's willing to harness the ability to do violence righteously. And I think that right. that situation was appropriate and absolutely called for in, in that particular situation. But imagine if nobody ever stepped up and did anything like that, how horrible everything else would be, because we know that there's evil in the world. And I think too many people think that, oh, you know, if you if you just treat everybody right and you give everybody hugs and you and, and you, you know, you, you, you talk about uh, equity and, and just giving everybody equal <laughs> opportunity, no harm will ever be done. Well, I mean, come on now. We know that isn't true. We know there's evil in the world. And so there has to be righteous men willing to step up to put an end to it. Yeah. And people had to die so we can get to the point where you can have conversations about equality. Which is know? unfortunate. So Sucks. I, I, I think, you know, people, you know, people live a very saucy, soft life, you know, nowadays. You know, I don't know if I got an old soul or what, man, but I didn't grow up in a generation. And I know I, I could say my anger was unharnessed when I was younger, but I didn't grow up in a generation of softies, man. I didn't grow up in a generation looking at this world like it's all peaches and cream. You know, it, it, this is a somebody had to die. Somebody had to die and kill to, for us to get to the point of freedom in this country. I mean, we, we see that all throughout the Bible, even the story of Jesus. He had to die. It wasn't no. Uh, he just got injured and beat up a little bit or somebody had an argument with him on, you know, uh, through mail or whatever. You know, they sent they sent somebody to, to give him a message or something like that. And it's like, no, Jesus had to die. There had to be death. There had to be a sacrifice um, for our lives, to, for, our, for our souls to be free. And, that, and, and, and people have to understand that's, that's just the way of life, man. You can't walk around life expecting everybody going to hand something to you or expecting everything to be all nice and cushy. Um, I, 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 I think that we have luxuries today that I'm thankful for, but we cannot forget that somebody lost their luxury so we can have it. Somebody had to give so we can get. Um, life is about push and pull, give and get. Somebody had to sacrifice. You know, I had to spend long hours hustling, working out hard so I can play football in college to get a full scholarship so that I can get my, so I can have uh, a degree, something that my parents couldn't pay for. But I did that not only for me, but for when my children are born, I can provide them more than I had. I can provide more than what I had. Even today, I hustle every day. I make two or three videos a day. I travel around the country. I've been to four different states just this month alone. Um, sometimes I don't sleep and that's not a great thing not to sleep, but I understand that I got to hustle and I got to do what I have to do. I have to give so that my children can be set up so my children can have. I had to go through a lot of stuff, a lot of pain, a lot of struggle. God put me through a lot of ups and downs, a lot of a lot of disappointment so that I learned how to come out of that disappointment in the proper way. So I learned how to overcome adversity. And then therefore I could teach my sons, this is how you overcome adversity. I'm glad I went through the things I went through. I'm glad I cried when I was in college and going through that with the football team. You know, football was my life. And they, you know, I felt that it was stripped from me. I was devastated. I cried. I'm a grown man. I cried, you know, uh, with the things that happened to me in football in college, especially one, one year I got injured and I was out for the whole season. I cried, man. I, had, I was on a boot for, I was on the crutches for six weeks. I was on a boot for like three or four months. I could barely walk, man. I was devastated, but I'm glad I went through those things um, in life. I'm glad I saw the things that I saw when I was younger. I saw the violence. I, I saw loss. I saw people, family members go to prison because that gives me a better perspective in life. So now when I, I can project it to my children, I'm hoping that they don't have to sacrifice or suffer as much as I did um, to learn these lessons that God has been able to teach me. So, you know, all these things are necessary, man. If you want to cake life, you don't want a life. You want adversity so that you can become better, so you can build. You know, it's like working out. And people that don't work out, I don't know what analogy to give them, but it's like working <laughs> out, man. Like when you work out and you do, you, you get sore, you're tearing your muscles down. They're getting torn down to build back stronger, to get bigger, to be more proficient. You know, when you run, I know somebody somewhere, you know, when they were in middle school or something, they had PE, even if they don't work out currently, you run, your lungs are burning, you, you feel like you want to quit, but you know that you see your progression when you continue to do that, especially if you ran track. You have to, you have to suffer so, so that you could be, so you can grow in progress, you know? 
uh, you know, that's just, that's just the way life is. And, you know, you should, people should be able to find beauty in that. Have you, have you always had this mentality or is this something you've had to develop? And if that's the case, how did you begin to develop the mentality that ad, ad, adversity is, is a positive, it's a net gain for you versus something that's happening to you? Because I think a lot of people believe that, you know, if, if they get passed over for the promotion or the woman dumps them or, you know, they deal with a medical condition or any number of things that could happen, they think the world is shitting on them and is out to get them. The world is amoral, but they, but they believe that's the case and they can't really see it as a, as a net gain and a positive in the long, in the long haul. Yeah. One of the things I heard this from a great person, so I'm not going to act like I came up with this term. Um, I can't remember if it was Mike Tyson or somebody like that. They said, uh, I think it was Mike Tyson. They said that life doesn't happen to you. It happens for you. Mm. I think, no, I think that was Ricky Williams, Ricky Williams. Life doesn't happen to you. It happens for you. And Ricky Williams gave the scenario of a lady ripping him off for millions of dollars. She was his accountant or something like that. Millions of dollars. She ended up going to jail over it. But you got to think, somebody ripped you off for millions of dollars. I mean, that's going to that's gonna be very heartbreaking. But he said, if it wasn't for that, he wouldn't have went to the next level. If it wasn't for mm-hmm. that, you know, he wouldn't have learned X, Y, Z. So I wish people would understand that. I, I, I think that this came to a crescendo when I got saved. Because growing up in the community I grew up in, around some of the family members and people I grew up with, it's always like life is happening to you. You know, like, oh, I don't know why the man, God is, the devil is chasing me today. The devil is after me today. And it's just this whole thing, the white man, you know, uh, they got us in the ghettos and we, you know, we ain't never going to be, you got to work twice as hard for the, to be, uh, to get a job versus a white man. And, you know, I grew up with that stupidity and it wasn't necessarily just from my parents. It was from peers and culture. And when I got saved, I started really thinking like, you know what? God is in control of my life. So if God is in control of my life, then these things are happening for me. They're not happening to me. So when I didn't make it to the NFL, which I was in the NFL draft, and, you know, if I would have played in college like I should have, in my opinion, you know, and my agent told me I would have been drafted in the first round. I was an incredible football player, an incredible athlete. But things went astray. But but it, I did make it to the NFL. It was hurtful, but I learned if I, if I'd have played in the NFL, yeah, I'd have made millions of dollars, but I wouldn't be the person that I am today. I don't think I would have been conservative. I don't think that, I mean, I, Lord knows what I would have become, but I believe that God has a purpose for me. So when I see things happening, I'm seeing them through the purpose. I'm not seeing them because they just randomly happen. You know, you don't randomly lose people in your life. You know, you, God is teaching you something. Um, and if you're willing to grow from it, you're willing to learn no matter how hard it is, you're willing to say, you know what, uh, I'm, I'm going to use, like, for instance, perfect example. Yesterday, I was notified by YouTube that I'm, that I'm banned for seven days for posting the truth about Dr. Fauci, right? Uh, quoted his quotes, but I guess his quotes at the wrong time uh, lead <laughs> to medical misinformation, right? Right, so, it's trouble. Yeah, um, for sure. Right. Ban me for seven days. Initially, I said, I was, I was kind of shocked. I was a little upset. But I said, you know what, God, you in control. You know, I said what I said. I'm banned for seven days. What's the silver lining in this? I've been wanting a break for a while from YouTube because I make all these videos every day. It's stressful just doing it oh, every yeah, day. Oh, yeah, I can't imagine. Years. And then dealing with the comments and everything else. I can't I even imagine. The comments and the people and the stress <laughs> totally. of knowing this stuff. Like, <laughs> totally. just knowing the stuff I talk about is stressful. <laughs> um, I wish it, Sometimes I wish I didn't know nothing what was going on in the world. You know what I mean? Yeah, but yeah. Knowing all this stuff and the nuances of investigations and the Kyle Rittinghouse trial and my Arbery trial, watching the entire trial. I mean, all of these things. But I said you know what, God may be giving me the break that I wanted. And it's funny because I spoke at four different, I've spoken four different states this month, which I get paid to speak. And I'm like, that covers the seven days that, I, that, I, that I'm that i that going to be offline. Mm, and right. also it's the holidays. Think about it. I'm, I got banned right during Thanksgiving. My whole family's here. I don't have to worry about posting on YouTube or doing anything. And the guy who worked with me on YouTube don't have to, but he with his family. My whole team with their families. So it's like God may have given me a break. And the funny thing is, the seven days is going to go all the way through past my book lunch. And I have a book lunch party on November the 30th. So it's going to go all the way past my book lunch party. It's like God has given me an opportunity, if I look at it, that he given me an opportunity to have a break during this season. 
And I believe God is doing this for a reason. And then when I come back on YouTube and I can post again and go live, I'm going to be refreshed. It's going to be better. The algorithm is going to treat me better. Whatever the case may be, that's the way I look at it, man. And I could get out down and out and be like, oh, man, what was me? But it's like, no, nah, God is in control. So let's roll with it. Let's, let's do what we got to do. Let's learn. Let's study. Let's, let's do more in the interim. Maybe I could read more, spend more time with my family, and we can go from there. Yeah, I, I believe that's the case, but let's just say hypothetically, even it isn't the case, it's just how you look at it. And that attitude, whether it's real or not, or whatever, or it's coming from God or not, it's, it's going to serve you. You know, like you get to choose the script. So are you going to choose something that's going to, it's going to make you worse and make you bitter and contentious, or are you going to choose a script that is actually going to serve you well and lead you to a better result? You did say something interesting I wanted to ask you about. You, you said something like, um, uh, you know, white, white people out to get us or keep us in the ghetto and keep us down, or I got to work twice as hard to get a job that a white person would get. Is that, is that a, uh, is that a thought that's pretty rampant in, in the black community? I mean, is that something that's, that is permeates through the community that, that a lot of people believe? Yeah. A thousand, uh, 20,000%. And the reason I say that is because people that are millionaires and billionaires are saying it, you know what I'm saying? Like they're preaching it, you know, uh, mm -hmm. Jay-Z talking about oppression in America. That fool's a billionaire. Um, you have, uh, I was just at this revolt summit, which is a black summit or whatever. David Banner was, was on a panel with me and, uh, and well, you know, I, with all due respect, I think that, uh, uh, Benjamin Crump didn't even say much, but Benjamin Crump was there. These, these are all millionaires. Benjamin Crump net worth is $5 million. And he's a civil rights attorney. And then David Banner, everybody know David Banner was a rapper. Um, he worked a lot of money and all they talk about is oppression. All they talk about is the system. Mm. Um, Colin Kaepernick raised by white people. He don't, he ain't got no sense of blackness in his life. He raised by white people. He's half white. Um, and the guy was an NFL player, almost won the Super Bowl, but it's oppression, oppression, oppression. And th that tells you that if the elite, the, 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 the wealthy amongst the inner city black communities or whatever, they are talking like this. Imagine what poor people are saying. Imagine what uh, people that live in, that actually live in the hood that are, they're looking at these uh, mountains that seem impossible to climb. Of course, they're saying the same thing. And, and that's that's why they're in the place that they're in. That's why black people in this country are in, a, in, in I would argue, um, somewhat of a deficit in our country because we have more abortions than everybody else. We commit more crimes than anybody else. Um, we are incarcerated more than anybody else. Um, I think our leaders are dumber than anybody else's. Um, and I'm not all of them, but some of them are. Uh, so, you know, I think that the reason why this has happened, and then our population is 13% of the population. We, we, we ain't never going to have a, a population influx because we have too many abortions in jail and murder. Um, when you look at the Hispanic population, they, they're just having, they having kids, they're migrating here. They, their vote, their representation is going to be well over what African-American people have. And sure. when African-American yeah. people was the foundation of this country, right? I mean, in conjunction with everybody else, but we were, we were a part of the foundation of this country. And so, we're going to wash away, wither away because of the rhetoric and this idea that we don't belong here. Hmm. And when our forefathers and people that came before black men that came before us, they fought that we have opportunities in this country and we do, but people want to make excuses instead of making it happen. They want to make excuses and say, Oh, we don't belong here. The constitution was never for us. Wasn't really for us. When these people are making hundreds of millions of dollars, billions of dollars in the same white system of oppression. You know, it, it's just, it's mind boggling to me. And that falsehood is really destructive. And I used to live in that falsehood and now I don't live in it anymore. So I know how destructive it was because it's all a lie. It's, it's propaganda. I was just in Memphis, Tennessee. Um, I was speaking at the University of Memphis like two days ago. And the rapper Young Dolph got murdered out there in broad daylight right. while I was doing a turkey drive for his own community. Um, mm. And while I was out there, I was in a car and my uh, car service is a black owned car service and everybody, all the drivers are black. So the guys in there listening to D.L. Hughley, who's a comedian and D.L. Hughley is literally when I got in the car, he's saying this country was never made for us, the white system and all this. And then a commercial comes on after D.L. Hughley. 
and speaking to the black residents of Memphis, the oppression and, and systemic racism um, that are holding us back. And I'm just like, how do you escape that? God helped me escape that. But how did you escape this when everywhere you turn, LeBron James is saying it, Jay-Z is saying it, Barack Obama is saying it, the radio guy is saying it, the commercial is saying it, uh, the, the left-wing media is saying it, CNN is saying it. Uh, how do you escape that reality? And I mean, not the reality, the false, the false reality. So it's very, it's very damaging. Yeah, I mean, it's it. Look, it's hard for me because it's. It, I'll say it this way: it's easy for me to say that that problem doesn't exist because I'm white, you know. And 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 so people have said, well, you can say that because you're white, and they're actually correct. It's easier for me to say that, and but I, at the same time, I try to see like, okay, well, like what systems are racist? Like w- what policies in place today are the problem? And, and I'm asking that in earnest, like, what is the problem? What, or, or even is, what is the solution outside of maybe reparations, which is, you know, something that happened in the past that isn't something I'm willing to negotiate with, but like, what actually do you want to see happen? And as I asked that in earnest, nobody's been able to answer that question for me. Oh, well, the, the whole, the whole, everything, it's just permeates. Well, like what, like what, tell me what, and, and yeah. they just can't come up with it. And that's the most fus- frustrating thing of it all. Is, you know, you it's tell like, me it's wrong, but you can't tell me exactly what's wrong. It's like being in a relationship with a woman and you say, she go, she got a frown on her face. And you say, baby, what's wrong? <laughs> Everything. You say, oh, okay. Well, baby, let me focus on one thing. What, what can I do to help you? Or what have I done? Can you name one thing? No, just every, everything is messed up. E- everything <laughs> is falling apart. You're like, right. well, financially, we're doing really well. But everything, uh, I, I, baby. Well, you never told me of anything that I've done that it made you upset. You were just happy yesterday, you know. You you, you just got a promotion on your job or whatever case may be, whatever scenario. But 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 still, it's like, well, I don't know what to tell you, and, right. and, and that's the same thing that's happening. <laughs> that's a great to, analogy. It's the same thing that's happening to uh, in the inner city community. Cause I'm black, and I'm telling you, you don't have to be black to see Stevie Wonder, even though he's black. He can see, even though he's blind, that this is bull crap. Uh, the systems, the court system. Okay, which judge is racist so we can all get him disbarred? Oh, but it's just the system. What system? The Constitution? Well, the Constitution said that we're all equal. It, and it don't say except black people right. or except uh, poor white people. It says that we're all equal under the Constitution and we have these inalienable rights that are given to us by God. Where in the Constitution does it discriminate against you? It, there is laws on the books that if you discriminate against a person, whether they're gender, race, sex, whatever, um, that you, your, your company will get shut down. Right. You could sue somebody over discrimination. What, what, like what laws are on the books? And, and, but then when you f- confront them with truth, like I said with the girlfriend, you say, you say, well, baby, um, you know, you have just told your friends every single day this week that you've been happy. You're the happiest woman alive. What's, what's the problem? And, or, or you could say, you know, based on our bank account, based on your success, everything is fine. You don't have any statistical data to show me anything else. You're just talking. Same thing with the black community. The incarceration rate of black people are out of control. They lock us up way more than anybody else. Okay. 54% of all the homicides that occur in the United States of America occur by black men. Black men who are murderers probably make up 1% or less than 1% of the population in America. Most violent crimes, over 50% of all violent crimes are perpetuated by black men. So if you put two and two together, you say, that's why black men are incarcerated disproportionately because they commit disproportional crimes. So what are you actually saying? If you're going to come up with a, a problem, look at it from a reality standpoint and then we can address it. You know, they go, oh, well, Kyle Rittinghouse. Well, that guy Coffee murdered a police officer. However, he was doing it in self-defense. Right, the, the, right. The, the ultimate, I want to screw a black man over and put him in prison for the rest of his life, is if a black man murder a white Kill cop, a police right? officer, sure. Kill a police officer. Um, I don't know if the cop was white, but he killed a police officer in a SWAT raid. However, they, they were able to determine that he acted in self-defense, which I support him because uh, according to the jurors, that got all the information that I don't have, 
they decided that he was innocent. I accept his innocence. I consider that man innocent, just like Kyle Rittinghouse. But, oh, if Kyle Rittinghouse was black, well, we have a black guy right here. This is a one-to-one -one example. Oh you, oh, you have nothing? Oh, we got Kyle Rittinghouse. He was berated in the media. Then you turn around the black kid from Dallas that went into school and shot and shot four people in the school over a fight. That guy, and they, they, they tried to lie on TV and say that he was being bullied. The black police chief came out and said, no, it wasn't bullying. See, I know people that live in the community and they were telling me that he was a drug dealer. He did a, you know, did somebody wrong in a drug deal. So mm -hmm. he had to carry a gun around because he was going to get jumped. He got jumped and he couldn't fight. Um, and after the fight, he pulled a gun and shot people. He got out the next day. The dude that just ran over all these people in Wisconsin, that dude is a, is a pedophile. He was, he, I, I believe he was convicted of sex trafficking a 16 year old, which he admitted on camera saying that he was pimping a girl and he didn't know yeah, she was I saw 16. That video. It was his baby mama or something like that. This guy just got out, just made bail of a thousand dollars and his tra rap, rap sheet is this long. He should be in jail, but no, he's out. And he's out committing crimes and end up killing people. But Charlottesville, the white guy in Charlottesville that ran over and killed one person, he's, they still talking about him today. The white mm -hmm. supremacists, the white supremacists. But this guy intentionally mowed down children. He could have killed more if, 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 I don't know, if they bought it, if he, if he hit him right. I mean, this guy ran over 30, 40, 50 people. Yeah, I mean, that, that's that's fortunate. That's it, It's horrible to say. It's fortunate that's all that happened because if you're running right. down a parade, there's hundreds, if not thousands of people right there. Like, that's we're fortunate. That's all that happened. Yeah, I mean, if he was going a little faster, he probably would have killed more people. But however, are they covering this the same way they covered the guy in Charlottesville? Are they covering? You know, it, 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 this, it, you know the guy in Charlottesville, I think, was a one-off. The guy, I, I watched the video. The guy was getting attacked. And he's dumb enough to blow through a crowd of people. And he hit maybe three or four people and killed one person, right? I think that's a different scenario than this black guy who uh, who intentionally, his whole motive, it wasn't an attack. It wasn't that he pulled up people beating his car, trying to knock his window out, mm -hmm. and he sped forward. This dude went to this place, went around. Some people are arguing that he did it intentionally, like intentionally meaning he wanted to get back at white people. You know, um, so... Regardless of that, you have a white man in Charlottesville and you have this black man. They are still talking about Charlottesville and they they want to brush this dude under the rug. The mainstream media don't want to talk about it. only Fox News and conservatives want to talk about him. I mean, we can we can we can keep going down the list. You got Donald Trump and you got Joe Biden. They bash Donald Trump every ounce of what he say that dude. They say he was mentally unstable and all this other stuff. Joe Biden is literally he cannot speak. He literally looked like an old senile man in office. Jo Trump is racist. Joe Biden literally did the eulogy of a former Klansman member, Robert Byrd. He mm. literally said um, that Strom Thurmond was his mentor. Strom Thurmond was a racist. Literally. Joe Biden have, ha, was, was the author, or at least he, he claimed he authored the 94 crime bill, which disproportionately affected black men and put him in prison. He literally did that. And he's not a racist. Nothing about him can be racist. He called uh, somebody a Negro the other day. Yeah. Nothing he can do is wrong. Everything Joe Biden, I mean, Trump can do is wrong. So, you know, these people pick and choose what they want to say, and none of it is rooted in reality, in my opinion. Well, I think that's why having these discussions on this podcast and why, of course, I wanted to invite you back and why they're so important, but then also, you know, you wrote a book to talk about this stuff as well. So beaten black and blue, um, talk to me about that because I, I think writing a book, doing a podcast, doing long form content, doing videos goes well beyond just the, the quick hits on the social media sites, you know, and trying to get those likes, this is going to explain the nuance. And, and I wish more people would listen. I wish more people would read. I wish, I wish more people would watch and maybe stop looking at these 140 character tweets for all their, <laughs> their source of information. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, God put it on my heart when I was a police officer. I don't know what year I was a cop. It was like probably the first few years I was a police officer. And I just, I, I, I would say, no, nah, it was probably a little bit halfway through my career when Barack Obama was in office. And I just remember feeling the pressure of being black and being a cop, you know, together. Right. So um, what was being the pressure? a black cop, Black people used to just, they just rail me. 
Oh, you pressure from, from the black community. But, Got it. Okay. Right. Just being black as a police officer. Right. Got it. it oh, you black, you're a sellout. You working for the white man. You're doing all this stuff. And then also just being a police officer in general, being a part of the blue, um, getting attacked by everybody, white, black, everybody want to attack you just because you're a police officer. So I got it from the black community and I got it from the community at large from just being a police officer and then being a black police officer. So I felt like I was beaten whether I was black or blue. You know what I'm saying? If I was right. a white man, I'd still get beat up for being a cop, even though, you know, yeah, you had, you had so it from both sides. From, it sounds know, like. Cop. Yeah. So, so the concept was just beaten. I felt beaten black and blue, you know, that kind of a comparison of being bruised uh, comparison of being black in, in a part of the blue. And so I said, one day I'm gonna write a book about this, man, because I, dude, I'm telling you, man, like before I became a cop, I thought I knew, I knew something about policing. I knew nothing. And I, I would argue that 90 percent of Americans know nothing about policing. They know nothing. They think they do. Watching cops is not even close to the nuances and the experience and exposure of law enforcement officers, stuff you see. Cops is a PG version of being a police officer. They don't show the real stuff. They don't sure. show you can't feel the real emotions. You know, these are just scripted stuff that they it's not scripted, but they take video and then they cut all the stuff that can be dramatic. Um, watching people get amp you know, people being amputated and dead and reviving people doing CPR and watching babies die. Like, you know, all of that is censored. They don't have no idea. I had no idea that police did the stuff that they did before I became a police officer. And going through that, I said, God, man, I mean, police need their story told. We need to at least hear from our side, from the police perspective, because we hear the narratives from the media, our, our racist whites institution. It's like, well, what about the black officers on the police department? We, you, we working for the white racist institution? It, it's just nonsense. So I wrote the book and I interviewed other police officers because I don't believe that every, every scenario is Brandon Tatum's scenario. So I had five of the police officers that I interviewed. Th uh, three of them were black and two were white. Um, all of them wh whom, whom I know that are really great police officers and they give their experience. Like this is what it's like being a police officer. And, and I, think, I think they all were current at the time that uh, I interviewed them for the book, that they telling you exactly what they've gone through, through the George Floyd situation, through, you know, all of the police brutality in 2020, like, uh, you know, they, they're explaining to you, this is what my experience is. Coming from the inner city, being black, this is what my experience is. And then two of the white officers, and one of them was an officer who um, was the one that gave me my first ride along, Officer Sean Payne. What is it like being a police officer in, in today's society? What does defunding the police actually mean? What is the consequences of, of and what is police brutality and what's not police brutality? What was the George Floyd thing all about? You know, I explain all of that stuff in my book. I debunk that police came from slave patrols, you know, uh, which was very I think I debunked that in probably like a page. Um, <laughs> so because it was very easy to debunk because it's bull crap. But I felt like this book was was the ability or at least I felt like with this book, I can provide the ability to give police officers a voice and for people to be able to have some insight into what we're going through in a time like like today. What's your, and I'm glad you did this because it's, it's it, you know, it's really important. I think most people listening would, would support um, police officers, you know, not 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 blindly. I mean, that's not what I'm suggesting, yeah. you know, because I know that there are obviously instances of injustice. There's obviously police officers who take advantage of the system or utilize their power for wrongdoing. Um, you know, obviously, I think it's obvious that when we talk about supporting police officers, we're supporting righteous work, not unrighteous actions um, at, at the hand of, of a few. I, I think I can say that. And, and most people would believe that. But what what are you feel is the ramifications of this whole like movement over the past, I would say really year to year and a half of defunding the police. Like where do you actually see this leading? Well, you know, I think everything ebbs and flows, right? So you're going to have a downside and then it's going to recover at some point. But I think that we're definitely in like a, a police depression, you know, because when you like you out there, putting your life on the line every day and you have an expectation that look i'm doing things at 100 miles per hour i got a split second to make these decisions if i'm making this decision in good faith and it's the wrong decision i'm protected i'm acting in good faith if you rip that away from a police officer and say you on your own jack we want you we want you to patrol we want you to put your life on the line but bro if you make a mistake 
Lord <laughs> forbid you think it's a gun right. and it's not a gun, but it's a cell phone right. in the middle of the night, pitch black darkness. Oh, you going to prison for the rest of your life. You, you don't deserve to live. You know, I mean, cops are like, wait a minute, man. Like, I'm not doing this job for that. I'm not, I'm not putting my life on the line and make split second decisions just for you to judge me for three months. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? Y'all got a year to put a case together against a police officer, but he had, he had a, a half a second to make that decision. And so I think a lot of poli great police officers are retiring. Uh, and, and this is the thing about retirement. If you're at the age of retirement for a police officer, that means you have a lot of experience. That means you have a lot of level of, of leadership for the most part. That leadership and experience is now gone. And you have young officers with no guidance coming up in a system of fear and, 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 and a lack of understanding and guidance from older officers that have been here through generations of bad, you know, policing going up and down. And then you got good men who are now turned 21 who say, I always wanted to be a police officer. I, I was born for this. And then they like, oh, I, I can't do it. The right. good men. Of course. Say, I, I'm not doing that. I mean, I, the policing ain't what I what I thought it was growing up. All that I wanted it to be. You'll go to prison for doing the right thing if you white and you shoot a black man. It, it ain't no if, ands, or but, man. A, lot, a majority of the time, you get done wrong. Even if you didn't go to jail, you get fired because of political correctness. You lose your job. You lose your livelihood. All that you've worked for, all that academy work, all of that training, all of that stressfulness in FTO, they throw you under the bus on one incident. And so people are, they're not working on the police department. The ones who are there, not every police officer, but I believe that a good majority of the ones who are there, they're not proactively policing. I'm not going to go and go, go over the top anymore. I'm a, you called for service. I'll show up to the service. If it get, if it get hasty, I ain't put my life on the line. Um, that's y'all, you know, I mean? I'll take the case report. Um, right. You know, I see I see Ray Ray and them doing a hand to hand. I know Ray Ray is passing drugs through this community. That's the last five or six people that died probably bought drugs from him. But but no, no, no. Yeah. Because if I chase him down, he pull a gun on me and I have to use force against him. I'm a bad guy. So let Ray Ray sell drugs over there. I'm good. Mm. I just I know that I know this guy because word on the street. This guy is, 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 is uh, trafficking stolen guns. But man, I don't want to get into an interaction with this guy and it goes south. So as long as I don't see it, I'm I'm hands off. I know I know mm. the dude selling drugs at this house, this trap house. I pulled over three or four people from this house that I had they had drugs on. You know what? I don't even want to take it there because I don't want them to do a raid and kill somebody and then my best friend get in trouble because he's the SWAT team sergeant. So I'm not saying this is what happened. I'm saying in a, in, a, in a hypothetical situation, this could draw this could be a conclusion drawn about what, how people feel about these things. You know, they want to kill each other every day. So what, why would I care? I'll, I'll yeah, show up I, after they did. So, yeah, I don't think, I mean, you say this is, this didn't really happen, but I, I don't think that's too far of a stretch of the imagination to say, yeah, obviously why would a police officer go above and beyond duty when not only does he put his own life at risk, but his livelihood, his family's livelihood, and just his way of life. <laughs> why would you do that at, at this stage? But let me ask you this. I mean, in, in, in lieu of defunding the police, which is an asinine uh, notion to me, do you feel like there is any sort of reform needed within the police departments generally i'm saying obviously we can't isolate one police department but generally do you feel like there's a need for any sort of reform you know i i hate the word reform because they've just bastardized it but um i think there's always room for improvement in law enforcement you know with technology um with with just what we learn about behaviors from people and there's always room, room for improvement you know one one thing that I wish that police officers or police departments would reconsider is pursue policies in certain situations. When I was a cop, I was mad we couldn't pursue people um, in the city. We couldn't unless it was a felony, a, a aggressive felony against a person. Um, what was no the what crime. was the logic behind that? Well, because they didn't want people to get killed unnecessarily because people that because in Tucson is it's, you, you're in a city that's dense. You're in a dense, saturated city. Sure. Um, that most of the roadways are red lights and stuff like that. So it's, it's we only got one freeway to go through the city of Tucson. So the, the spirit behind is that within the city, they want to mitigate pursuits because criminals don't care. They blow red lights, T-bone and kill people. They run people over. They're so desperate. They may actually kill more people or cause more damage 
then it's then it's worth catching a person that didn't commit a violent crime against a person, right? Mm. You're talking to a person that shoplifted, they want to flee from you. Okay, are you really willing to T-bone grandma in the intersection uh, over a person who who got a misdemeanor shoplifting? You know, right. so the spirit yeah. behind that is to mitigate the fallout and somewhat the lawsuits too. I mean, I'm sure that's one of them. Um, so it made sense to me. When I was a cop, I was mad because we didn't get to pursue nobody. And the county pursued people for suspended driver's license. You know what I'm saying? And it was fun. You <laughs> know, like, I got to move to the county. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it was uh, pursuing people was fun. I'm not going to lie. It was fun chasing people. You know, it's like a <laughs> real game of uh, tag. You know what I mean? And, That's uh, right. Car going 100 miles per hour. So Yeah, with real consequences for sure. <laughs> right. So, but I think some, some departments may still have antiquated perspective on pursuits and people are continuously getting killed. Police officers are dying in these pursuits as well. So I think that mm. I wish that, that that's a that's a point that I wish that police departments would reconsider. I'm not saying every police department should not have a pursuit policy because some police departments, that's what it is, that's what it is. You shouldn't run from the police. Um, but I, I wonder, I wish that we could revisit that. All the other stuff, man, like <clears throat> generally speaking, the use of force continuum, use of force policies are A1 in my opinion, you know, maybe over time you can make it better, be more proficient at it. But the way the use of force policy is, it makes sense to me. Um, I don't think we should change that because they're starting to get softer on policing. And that's what getting people hurt. When I was in the academy, they trained us, ask, tell, make. That's it. There ain't, mm -hmm. there ain't much talking. I ask you, sir, please put your hands behind your back. Sir, put your hands behind your back. Then I make you. There ain't right. no negotiating with you especially when I have probable cause to arrest you, or I have reasonable suspicion to detain you. I got to move. You need to know I'm not playing with you. If you think I'm playing, I'm a coward, then you're going to want to fight me and run and all of that stuff. You know, so, but, but the, the, the concept of reform is the problem because people are pointing at situations where reform isn't the problem, right? You talk about Breonna Taylor. What, you don't need to reform. They shouldn't have came to the door with a gun and shot the police officer. That was a that was a legitimate warrant that was actually a no knock warrant, but they decided to not new, use the no knock exception. They knocked on the door. They right. And I don't think enough. a lot of people know that. I think most people think they executed that as a no knock warrant. Yeah, no, they didn't. See, this is the thing. I'm going to say this real quick because people may not understand this. Because I was on the SWAT team. And then, of course, I know a little bit about the warrant situation. But what happens is when you have a violent felony, uh, felonious criminal like Jamarcus Russell, I mean, Jamarcus Glover. Um, you have somebody that's that's violent like that, and they hit multiple spots in one night, right? Because they didn't know which place he was going to be at. This guy's mm. a violent criminal. They need to have, in case of exigent circumstance, they need to have the no-knock exception. So every warrant they got had a no-knock exception, but they but they reserved that no-knock for the place that they figured that Jamarcus Glover was going to be at. And all the other places, they did not have to use it but they reserve the right to use no knock in case of these exigent circumstances. So Got it. They, they found a particular house with him in it. They no knocked and they, the SWAT team hit that house. Breonna Taylor, although they had a no knock exception, they decided not to use it because she wasn't considered a violent criminal. And of course they didn't know that her boyfriend was in there with a gun ready to shoot the cops when they opened the door. So they decided to knock because she was a low level criminal and people didn't, people may not understand that. Now the legislation that was passed, which is the stupidest thing I ever heard in my life, they've now done away with no-knock warrants. Now, how stupid is that? No-knock warrant didn't kill Breonna Taylor. A knock warrant killed Breonna Taylor. The no-knock warrant was executed properly on Jamarcus Glover's residence where they had multiple men in there with guns and drugs and all kind of other stuff. Mm -hmm. And so they essentially, if this legislation was passed before Breonna Taylor's death, she still would have died right. because they knocked on the door. Now, you know, so this reform that they are pushing are just social justice ways of demoralizing and getting rid of law enforcement and federalizing law, getting rid of municipal law enforcement and federalizing it. Um, like uh, George Floyd. There's no reform in George Floyd's situation. They don't teach you to put your knee on somebody's neck until they die. That's <laughs> not in the manual. That isn't, you know, a, that isn't a, stra a, a standard operating procedure. That's not. You could put your knee on a guy's neck, but my God, they don't teach you, put it on there until the, he dies. And when he dies, keep it on there and make an excuse to say, I'm waiting for EMS. The man is dying. Take your knee off his neck. Sure. Take the compression off of him, whether it's knee on the neck or not, because roll him in a recovery position. That's what they train you. He didn't do what his training told him to do. Walter Scott was shot in the back um, in South Carolina, I believe. 
he fought a cop and then he ran a cop shot him in the back tried to put a taser on him. the cop the cop messed up um they don't this train is the man at uh, the a wendy's a wendy's drive through or something is that is that the right oh no no, no walter scott was walter scott was open field he was running okay, through a yeah, field yeah got it okay and he shot him and killed him in the back and then the cop tried to place a taser on him but somebody was recording oh right um yeah but richard right. richard brooks i think his name is richard brooks was the one in the parking lot of wendy's that's or right burger king or whatever it was but you like there was nothing wrong with that situation because the guy pointed a deadly weapon at the police officer which is a taser fired it at the police officer's head and the police officer shot him twice or shot him once or twice and killed him um there's no need for reform in these situations because the ones that are unjustified are not even trained in the first place. The ones mm. that are justified are properly trained, but people just don't like what they see. So then they uh, persecute the police officer. So it's, it's so muddled, it's muddied. And, and then the people who are making these decisions don't know, they've never done a ride along. They've never gone to police academy. Every person that I talk to that, that pull this crap, they go, we need police reform. Okay, what, what, what reform? What, what reform? Oh, they need to de-escalate. Well, dummy, they teach us de-escalation in, in, in the academy. We learn de-escalation. And, and, and if we weren't proficient in de-escalation, we would be killing way more people than a thousand people a year when we have 300, 300 million interactions with people per year. We only, it only result in the death of a thousand and 99% and of them are armed criminals who are violent. So mm -hmm. um, if you were going, you know, you know, so the reform argument, what I said, there's some nuances to it and, and police officers should be able to make that decision. These other people who have no idea what they're talking about need to stay out of the argument. You know, that's like a, that's like a, like me and you, I don't know if you, what your medical experience is, but that, that's like me and you trying to tell a doctor, trying to go and talk about uh, medical reform. It's like, well, I, I, I've never done surgery before. I don't even right. know what they train y'all, but I'm telling you, you need to change this. That's wrong. And they, well, on the subject of medical malpractice, you know, I, I need to write this in an op-ed that I was doing earlier. Uh, but medical malpractice kill two hundred at least two hundred fifty thousand people a year. Uh, police kill a thousand. It would take police officers two hundred and fifty years to kill as many people as as the medical malpractice does on a, in one year. Mm. But nobody's talking about body worn cameras for medical professionals. Nobody talking about cameras and nobody's talking about reform for for. Uh, you know, the medical field and they kill and they, that's the minimum. Some believe it's 400,000 a year. So, you know, get well, real, I think man. that has to do, I think a lot of that has to do with the, uh, just the amount of amateur footage, you know, from cameras, people see something and the yeah. optics of it, whether it's right or wrong or within procedures or outside of procedures or not, you see the optics of some of this stuff. And, you know, frankly, a lot of it looks horrific from that one particular angle without any context, yeah. without any nuance, yeah. without knowing what the procedure is and what that individual did, just like we were talking about earlier with the nuance, like, tell me, tell me the entire thing. Like, let's see the entire thing, but we don't see it. We just see one angle and it looks bad. I don't think anybody can deny that it looks bad. Yeah. And, 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 you know, if you could snapshot many of the use of force that I've done in my career. I would look like a horrible police officer. There right. was one lady that was in the back of a patrol car. It, it, the funny thing is that she was a victim, man. Her boyfriend was drunk. They all were drunk. He pulled a knife on her, tried to stab her. One of the family members knocked the knife out of his hand, and we show up. We're arresting this guy for aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. He's walking to the car. She goes to throw a beer on top of him and hit all the police officers. So you know I have to detain her now because right. she's now assaulted police officers with beer. I, I arm bar, but she's so drunk that she's limp. So when I arm bar, she hit the thing. Boom, like a potato, like a sack of potatoes. Boom. And, you know, she claimed, oh, I'm pregnant. I'm pre my baby, my baby. And I'm like, oh, my God, this lady is pregnant. And then obviously her family was like, she, she lying. She's just fat. She's not pregnant. But if you would have <laughs> caught the instance of me arm barring her and her hitting the, hitting the deck like that, you people was there, oh, police brutality. Or she was sucking dirt in. So once I got her down, She's sucking dirt in her mouth, trying to choke herself. Oh, 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 doing all that. And I'm like, so I had to sit her on her back. She acts like she's choking on her back. Oh. It just, just, I, I have no idea why this oh lady's so stupid. Gosh. Then I, I had have to, to sit her up that. and we tried to put her in the car. Now she's like 250, right? And she's drunk limp. We trying to put her in the back of the car because she's under arrest. She got handcuffs on. We're trying to lift this big old girl up in the car 
And the back of the car is not big. So one cop is in the back seat trying to get her up. We trying to pick Holy her legs girl. up. She just limp. Now, if you just started the camera there, she, while we're lifting up, her pants came down. So her underwear is out. And her boyfriend is in the back of the cop car in the street saying, uh, man, at least pull her pants up, man. Now, if you screenshot that, you'll think, look what they're doing to that poor lady. She's clearly, yeah. she's clearly drunk or unconscious. No, she was playing. She was faking unconscious so we couldn't put her in the car. You know, so, and then I think we got to the jail. She said I raped her or something. So, you know, it, Jeez, man. you know, this kind of stuff is why when I see a clip of a video, I say, okay, I let me see more. You know, let me right. see more. There's times where I had to punch people and knock them up. This one guy, he was 300 pounds, big old bodybuilder dude. He was the call, 911 caller. He called and said his girlfriend and him got into an argument. When I pulled up, she I saw her leaving the scene. It was just an argument, so I'm like, let me check in with the guy, make sure it wasn't more than just an argument. I didn't know what he looked like. He's sitting at a mailbox. He, he, he does this when I drive by. So I'm like, maybe that's him that called in. Because, of course, you, they don't got a picture when they called in. Sure, so I go right. down to the end of the block, and I, I call the person who called in. I said, hey, what, what does the guy look like? Or I couldn't get in touch with him. He comes walking from the mailbox towards my police car. So I get out because I don't know what this dude is doing. He was there with a friend. His friend is telling him, don't do it, man. Don't do it. I'm thinking this guy's going to attack Yeah, you're me. going on alert. Sure, of course. So a, he was going to attack. And this dude is way bigger than me, dude. He's like 300. He was a bodybuilder. You could tell he still had his legs. He was like 6'5", 300-pound dude. And so, of course, you know, I, I act like nothing was going on. And I drop, I, I, I impact pushed him as hard as I could, and I dropped him. And so, I mean, he flew, dude, because he was drunk. He flew back, bumped his head on the <laughs> ground, and he's all. And I'm on top of him, ready to, to go to work if I had to. And I don't know if his friend is going to attack me. Long right. story short, man, he was wrong. He ended up, my, my sergeant didn't even charge him with it, but he was wrong, whatever the case may be. Um, but if somebody would have just caught a clip of him walking up to me and me hitting him and him hitting the ground like that and me on top of him and I'm all with my gun. I, mean, I, don't, I don't think I put my gun on that guy, but I was just like, get back, get back. People would have been like, oh, look at that cop. Look, they just so aggressive. They always doing that man wasn't doing nothing. Like, no, bro, he was attacking me, man. And you right. just catch a clip, of, right. a clip of it. So anyway, it's it just like you said, the proliferation of these cameras and stuff right there. It just that's why I tell people if it sounds too juicy, take a take a next second guess to get more information, because normally if it's too juicy and it's too, oh, man, just shot this man for no reason. Right. Like, right. There's more to it, man. I saw something on Twitter the other day and somebody had said something, something to the effect of nobody ever felt like a fool for waiting for more information to come in before formulating an opinion or something like that. Yeah. And I thought, man, that's exactly right. Cause we do like, I do it too. I'm not, I'm not going to say yeah. I don't do it. You know, I see something and, or see some outlandish headline or, or claim or social media post. I'm like, Oh, you know, and blow up and outrage and, then later you realize, oh, that really wasn't what it was. So I think we need to exercise some discernment and how quick we are to, to judge a scenario we know yeah. nothing about. I'm, I, almost all of these major situations, I've been 100% right on it because I was one of the only people that said, okay, let me, let me just see. I know police can't just kill you like this. They, right. they might, but that's not normal. Let me do a little research. Let wait a little bit. They come out that the guy pulled a gun and here's the, the second camera. The police released the body worn footage. And it's like, I told y'all, I told y'all <laughs> like yep. Makai Bryant. They like, yep. oh, they just killed. I, I remember the headline came out. They just killed a 16 year old girl, man. They just shot her dead for no reason. And I'm like, they just come shot an unarmed 16 year old girl for now. no reason. Let me just watch this because it could be, but it's rare that they what do you know? She had a knife and she was going to stab, stab her. Trying to stab and I remember somebody, yeah. I uh, posted that and I posted it at night, at night, midnight. It had a million views in like an hour, two hours. And then YouTube cut it because they didn't want it to go viral. And they cut it. They gave an age restriction and it died at 1.2 million mm. views in like a few hours. But regardless of that, like, you know, you, you got to take your time and realize that if it sounds crazy, just do some more research. Do some more research. Like, like Kyle Rittinghouse. He just out there, he was running around killing people. And I said, you know, that doesn't sound right that the kid just out just gunning down people. When, when I see a little bit of an image of him cleaning up the city, he looks like an unassuming kid. Well, you know, he wasn't just killing people. They were attacking him. You know, right. try to hit him with right. a skateboard. One guy pulled right. a gun. Pulled a gun on him. <laughs> he pulled a gun. But you know what? One guy had balls. The other guy didn't have balls. That's the only reason why 
Kyle Rittinghouse is alive today. Uh, Rosenbaum didn't think he would do it. Oh, this little corny little little kid. I mean, that boy ain't gonna shoot me. Okay, now he, you know, you know how you see those clips where a person's talking and they like in heaven, like, oh, what the yeah. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> Look at this clown. Oh man, he got me. You know what I'm saying? So, That's right. <laughs> Oh, but, man. You know, and the other guy, too, you know, his death was a little slower. But, you know, these people, you know, whatever. But you can never take things at face value, even women. Oh, he ran, man, raped me. I got raped. This man raped me. I say, I always say, OK, OK. It sounds very compelling, but let mm -hmm. the information Let's come figure out it out. Yeah, because this could be people do lie. And when I was a police officer, about 80 percent of women who said that they were raped were lying. Um, mm. and unfortunately, this is one people don't, I don't want to get into it, but people don't understand that like most rape, uh, that people report are disingenuous. The most people who actually get raped, they don't never report it. Um, and that's a problem, you know, cause some people use that as a tool, you know, like I said, I, in my whole career of people, uh, calling for rape, whatever, it was like three women. Uh, one was a meth head that I didn't believe her at first. You know, I ain't gonna lie. She was a meth, she was crack, she was meth out out of mind she couldn't even talk straight he raped me whatever it was a boyfriend and i'm like but you know you got to do an investigation oh man he went to prison for a very long time because he did he stabbed he, he got stabbed he tried to stab her all kind of crazy stuff actually happened to her um and she was really telling the truth but you know that was like one and a lady uh a guy said he was a tucson police officer and he groped her on a oh on a yeah Uber ride but he actually worked for the state he actually worked for the state which was he did and so that fool i don't know what he was thinking because she had him take her she she he had her take him to his house his residence on the uber app with his real information and he groped uh. her on the thing so he went I, i'm sure he went to jail I, I i i wrote that case report good and it was like one other girl that actually got raped but it was a bunch of them that were like boy they cheating on their boyfriend boyfriend walks in Oh, he raped the guy raped me and they go all the way through until we, they get to the detective and they're like okay no i didn't get raped i was just afraid uh, some women being like, oh, I don't remember what happened or whatever. But, you know, I've learned through trial and error that listen to the first thing you hear, but understand that there's two sides. Once you get both sides of it, then you can better make an assessment. Never make a decision on one side of an argument, even if it's incredibly compelling. I had a lady beat. She had knots on her head, blood coming out of her nose. My boyfriend beat me up. Get him. He beat me up. And I remember thinking like, oh, this dude is a piece of crap. I can't wait to catch him. Right. And I sure, of course. Stress. Oh, he going to get his whooped. I see him and he got scratches and bloody nose too. And I'm like, what the? And so he explained. And I, I'm telling you, dude, I was emotionally invested in the fact that she was beat up like that. And I was like, I'm going to find this guy. Right. He, he said, bruh, that she attacked me. I was asleep. She must have went through my phone. And thought I was cheating with some girl, and she attacks me in the, in my sleep, and I didn't know it was her. I didn't know who it was. I was swinging in 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 the pitch black darkness. I thought somebody was robbing me, and I'm swinging, and I hit her a couple times, and then I realized it was her. After a while, you know, and then she admitted to it. Yeah, you know, he was cheating on me. So while he was asleep, I just started hitting him because he, he shouldn't cheat on me, and I'm just like, oh my gosh. You started this? You the one? That's why you got knots on your head because this dude is getting beat in his sleep and he don't know what's happening to him. You know what I'm saying? And so, you know, but brother, I was in, that was the last call that I ever got invested like that emotionally um, on the first sign of, of a victim, you know? So I hope that that story would compel people to say it can look like it's right. It can be, the world thinks it's right there could be an alternative reason to why this happened. You know what I'm saying? So, well, I think this is a good thread line that's run through the whole conversation is just, Hey, look, there's nuance. There's things that you need to understand and let's not take the characters on Twitter. Let's try to do our own research. Let's look at multiple sides and all the angles, and then we can formulate better decisions. And I think more people should do that. And the more that we do, I think we'll all come to better conclusions on to how to, how to, how to lead ourselves. Well, how to lead our communities well and just just be better human beings in general. Yeah, 100%. 100%. I couldn't agree more. Well, right on, brother. Well, I appreciate you. I wish you the best of luck with the book. Guys, if you want to pick up a copy, please do. Beaten Black and Blue. I think it's out today as of the release of this podcast. So make sure to pick up a copy of the book. Support Brandon. 
Brennan, I appreciate you for round two coming back on. I always appreciate your insight and uh, your commentary. You're a level-headed dude, and that's what we need, people who are rational about it and spreading the truth. So keep up the good work, man. I appreciate you. I appreciate you, Ryan, man. Thank you for having me on. And, and uh, yeah, you guys can get my book. Just go to beatingblackandblue.com. It's available on Amazon. Uh, so, and thank you for having me on, man. I really appreciate it. Great conversation. Man. You bet. We'll link it all up so the guys can know where to go. Thanks, brother. Appreciate it.